is, hello, hello. Do we have to do what we do in kindergarten? <laughs> Great. Great. Our next speaker is Dr. Moira Aiken. She is the professor of, a professor of medicine at the University of Washington in Seattle and the director of the Adult CF Clinic at the University of Washington since 1989. She's going to be speaking about the top 10, her prescriptions for a healthy adulthood. Please help me welcome uh, Dr. Moira, a Moira Aiken, who is returning. She was with us last year as well. So thank you so much for coming back. Sure, if I'm switched on, am I switched on? Switched on, switched on. Yes, yes. great, perfect. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me back. It uh, really is my pleasure, and uh, thank you for choosing the title of my talk. I found it uh, challenging to uh, um, think of uh, ways of which my top ten really were, and so um, I sought out excellent help, and I sought out the help of my patients. And I will give them credit along the way because they really helped construct this talk. So I hope that their top 10 is uh, the top 10 things that you all would like to uh, think about. So this is definitely a talk with my bias to it. So uh, I'm going to do this in descending order. Uh, I thought of um, top, the top 10 records. I thought of the top 10 books. Um, so I, and I thought not to foreshadow it with giving you the list. You're going to see them one by one by one, and then at the end you'll get the top ten. So you'll have to wait to the end to get them all listed that way. So I'm going to start in reverse order, ten, nine, eight, and I think number one is the most important. Um, and I do think the talks that we've already had here um, have foreshadowed, actually, what the patients also wanted to know about. So my top 10, and I really feel like I'm preaching to the, uh, to the choir here, is to be medically informed about CF. Well, the, the audience here obviously is seeking that out. You have really gone out of your way to spend this weekend getting that information. So you're already on my top 10. And as my former nurse said, who ran the clinic for 10 years, um, she believes that patients and their families, knowing the road ahead, makes bumps in the road easier uh, to um, understand and tolerate. Um, and therefore, knowing it um, is helpful, even although we want to perhaps deviate it from it with these wonderful pipeline of drugs that hopefully are coming. So coming to the CFRI is important. Um, also, the cystic fibrosis website, everyone should be very familiar with that website. It is an excellent website. It is screened. Uh, the information you get on that website is accurate and conservative and won't be misleading. Um, and the other big uh, uh, point is um, the CF center providers hopefully will be fully informed. But I do thank my patients. This is myself uh, when I was starting off the clinic. I am the less tall person at 5'8", um, and I learned a lot from my patients. Uh, they are uh, wonderfully healthy, and it's been my incredible pleasure to be the director of that clinic for um, 24 years now. So being medically informed about cystic fibrosis, this conference has already done a fantastic job, actually, of thinking about all the body parts of cystic fibrosis when I'm taking a quick fast history. I actually do it from the top down, or you could do it focused on um, the, the one that's most important to that individual. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about uh, pancreatic disease, but a little. People get uh, CF-related diabetes. I'll spend a little time with that. Exocrine insufficiency, and we're going to hear a lovely talk about that tomorrow. Rarely pancreatitis. Liver disease usually happens in childhood if you're going to get it, or severe liver disease. So by the time they're adult, hopefully they don't have it, uh, but we already know, although you can get uh, gallstones or cholelithiasis. Um, gastrointestinal problems are problematic. A lot of people have reflux, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or poor motility and uh, ob obstipation and constipation. Those are common. GI malignancy is increased in CF, but it's relatively rare, and we don't deviate from normal people in screening for that. 
Uh, bones are often uh, uh, an issue with um, osteoporosis and osteopenia. That's thought to be poor, poor absorption of the calcium uh, and vitamin D. And also the inflammation in the lungs causes uh, laying down of bad bones. Um, we already heard a uh, mother talking of her child who had um, arthropathy associated with cystic fibrosis. Um, sweat test uh, was beautifully presented earlier this morning. Um, it's obviously the diagnostic test and has been a fabulous outcome with a pipeline. And fertility issues, uh, more common in men, uh, but we heard also of uh, Kaleidico uh, helping a woman to conceive. Um, so there is a mishmash of uh, diseases and covering all these rapidly is really um, a hard task to do. However, uh, knowing this road ahead, it's nice to know how prevalent they are as uh, people get um, older. So Dr. Kwan and I wrote a review about this. We're using the CF registry, the prevalence of disease, the percent, and the age of the patients on the x-axis. And here we are when we're 50. I'm hoping my patients get older than 50. These are the people that help me with this talk. And this cystic fibrosis-related uh, diabetes is becoming a player here. Sinus disease, what a fabulous talk we just heard from Dr. Wang. Bone disease that we talked about. Uh, depression, which I think is overly reported. Arthropathy. Kidney disease, which we'll come back to with therapies, and liver disease as you get older is less important because it's, it's, it's diagnosed in childhood. Mine, so that's number 10, being medically informed, and I can't cover it all, but I think uh, directing you to where you can find out about it is very helpful. My number nine, I thought, was understanding, and this question came up too um, yesterday, I think in private conversation, understanding the structural organization of the cystic fibrosis network because this helps you reach your needs and if it doesn't we have failed you and we shouldn't fail you i think this network is amazing i think it's an amazing uh, model that has been created it was founded uh, 60 years ago and 50 years ago the centers started um, uh, being placed um, and currently, the CF Foundation supports and accredits about 120 CF care centers nationwide. And you can see the dots scattered over the United States. And they roughly represent where, people, uh, where the populations are based. So I'm here at the top. And from a lung transplant point of view, we serve an area of 900,000 square miles. Um, so I'm still on number nine, the CF network continued. The, the, the mission of the foundation is to try to perform uniform state-of-the-art clinical care. The um, also mandate that we advance the science through research. All the centers are meant to be involved in some kind of research. And they mandate that we do continuous quality improvement. I'll show you my quality improvement from last year. It was all about diabetes, even although I'm a pulmonologist. And finally, teaching is very important for the next generation, teaching the providers, families, and the general public so that we can um, raise uh, money, help with the Boomer Foundation, get everyone involved with this disease. And I, I do think they've done a remarkable job because, talk about herding cats, the, these centers are in all sorts of different places. State university centers, I am in a state university center. Private university centers, private hospitals, private practices, especially in remote areas, and HMOs. They're all there. And down here, you in California, I, there are several centers. So the cystic fibrosis guidelines um, mandate that all these centers are visited by site visitors so that we make sure that these things, clinical care, research, quality improvement, and teaching occur in every site. My site visit is in 2015, and I'm already getting nervous about it. Dr. Flume site visited me one time, so I know how rigorous it can be. Um, but it means that the bar is high. So if you're going to an accredited center, the bar should be high. Number eight, 
is therefore, and that harps back to that one question that was asked, know your center. Now, I would argue that my center is perhaps the most beautifully located center. Here it is. We are in this building here. This is Lake Washington, Lake Union, and the cut through. It's beautiful, the Husky Stadium for the football players. It's beautiful. Um, as a site visitor, I, Patrick visited me, but I visited many people. And I found out, and we found out, that every center has some unique strengths. It has sometimes unique weaknesses, but it has unique strengths. And I tried to incorporate those into my site. So you should have a handout on the orientation of your center or a website orientation of your center. You know, who is the go-to person at your center? We, we heard somebody who was transitioning and they didn't know. Who's the go-to person? There must be somebody or people that, who is your, oh, my RN is Laurie. If you want something at the unit, Laurie. Who's the clinic coordinator? Who's the social worker? Who do you go to? You need to know how to do this. How do you make an urgent appointment? How do you get seen urgently? How are acute exacerbations treated at your center? They're different at my center to Dr. Flume's center. How, what, what, what's going on at your center? Is it a lung transplant center? We are a big lung transplant center. Is it a, people want to know these things. Um, our logo, not coming out here very well, but the University of Washington Medicine, patients are first. And they mean that. Patients are first. And this is about half our team. Dr. Wang had more of his team. The rest, I guess, were all actually working. But we're a mishmash of physicians, nurses, nutritionists, social worker, respiratory therapists, and researchers. And the CF Foundation mandate that all these people are there. All these people have to be involved. This is the go-to person. That's Laurie. And we give everyone a handout, day one, and we'll give another one another day, who we all are, our names, all of us, all our contact numbers, everything, so that you go away with a piece of paper that's yours, that who we are, how do you contact, how it all works. Very important to know your center. So, okay, that's my center, great, it's beautiful, but is it any good? And another inspirational thing regarding quality improvement is that you can go on to the CF website and sort of maybe find out if your center is any good, maybe. Um, how you do that is you log on to the website, you get the care center network, you want to review the center data, you have to register to do that, and boom, up comes a beautiful graph such as this. It's amazing. So this is my center. I thought I'd show mine and not Dr. Flume's. It seemed only fair. So this is the body mass index, which means your weight divided by your height in meters squared. Body mass index. I now think in a body mass index. So 20 to 25 is normal. And what it shows you here is that the CF Foundation think that the goal weight should be 23. I'm about 23. I almost calculated last night, but I had a large dinner. Um, then, uh, so the, the national average for cystic fibrosis is 22.7. So look at us. The most recent year was 2011 that we've got data for. And bingo, I am so proud. We got to 23, even although we're a lung transplant center. And more importantly, and helpful to me, is that we made an improvement slowly, but we were going in the right direction. So we had decided actually some years ago to try and get our weights up because we were below the national average and we succeeded. So it's not only useful to you to know your center, it's actually useful for the physicians to know their center. The caveat is that the way the data is placed is not completely um, transparent, I'd say. In, for example, the post-lung transplant data isn't always entered, which is a disadvantage to my data because I get people referred in very ill from all these different states, and then we transplant them, we get the lung function to go up, and it's not recorded here. So, it's, so you, you, if you don't see a good number, you should go to your center and say, why is that number not better? Because it may not be as obvious as this graph. Okay, um, number, number seven. I am very grateful to, my, uh, uh, to Mark Guntram. He asked me to give him credit, personal communication. 
He optimized your clinical care. So you found your center, you think it's okay, you should optimize your care. And he said, be prepared. I felt it was like a girl guide. Be prepared um, for your clinic visit. His advice, and I think it's terrific, and he said, write down your list of questions and concerns for your clinic appointments. Write them down so your brain doesn't go fuzzy and you forget. Do you have insurance issues? It's a big one. It comes up all the time. And can we help with that? And as a, as a personal thing, um, I say, please, please ask your providers what you want or what you would like to change. Um, sometimes I feel that we, 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 there's a little bit of miscommunication, and so it's hard for us to know exactly what you want unless you tell us what you want, and then we can address it. And also, providers really like to know what your observations are or concerns between your clinics. We often inherit somebody as an adult program from a pediatric center, and we're different. And there may be, well, why is it a little different there? Even though that we're trying to provide uniform care, why is it different? Just come forward, tell us what your different, you know, what, you know, what your observations are. Also, um, internet information, uh, um, the physicians may not totally agree with everything that's on the internet, and it's good to have an open rapport about that. And social media can be, I think, quite misleading. And so if there's something that seems different from your care, speak up. Well, um, point number six, and I give this credit to Gwen McDonald, uh, who it was my um, uh, nurse before she uh, retired. She said, people with cystic fibrosis should live your life on the assumption that it's going to be a long one. We heard beautifully from Jerry last night, but he, as a teenager, didn't think he was going to have a long life. Well, that, I think, we shouldn't think that way anymore. We should live your life assuming it's going to be a long one. The, the, the graph here shows that the life expectancy of cystic fibrosis is continually improving. So what this graph shows is the percent of people surviving and age. And every decade, it gets better and better and better and better and better. We're living longer. It's just another way of showing that. So uh, we heard from a, uh, parents last night who have a new baby. Well, great, because she's in this new cohort, and she should have expect and assume that she's going to have a long life. Very important to, to have that. Um, number five. It's going to take a long time, number five, because um, this is all about the MD's perspective. So uh, talk about communication and partnership. I think that you have to recognize that MD's have a bias, and I think they have actually all the same bias. And the bias is, they want patients to live longer. They're, they have, I have completely bought into this. And there are many studies, some of which I've published and others uh, have published, that have looked at all these medical things that go into a long life, and they all show the same thing. And so the physicians are focused, focused on these endpoints, these clinical endpoints. They're focused on the forced expiratory volume in one second, and I will chat about that. They're focused on the number of acute pulmonary exacerbations a year, and I'll chat about that. They're focused on infection with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and I'll try to chat about that, but it won't overlap with Dr. Wang, but it might a little. And a little bit about diabetes, because maybe it, uh, actually in Dr. Lou's, it did, uh, um, it was important. In my own study, it wasn't important. And weight, uh, the weight, uh, the body mass index, weight over height. So let's start with the forced expiratory volume in one second. That's an outcome measure that Dr. Flume uh, presented uh, this morning, and I'm not sure if everyone in the room understands what the heck we're talking about with that. So I thought I would just spend a little time reviewing that. So FEV1, um, you may have seen these in the clinic, and if you have, sorry about the repetition, but here we go. So this is called a flow volume loop. So ple people are breathing along, breathing along, breathing along, and they say, blow it out, blow it out, blow it all the way, all the way, all the way, all the way, and breathe it. <gasps> right? Got that? Yeah? I'm good at this, right? So, so the axis here, this is, this is, a, and I'll, this is a funny term, because this is flow, flow in liters per minute. So it's a two, it's a funny thing to get your brain around. 
And on this axis is volume. So here is your force vital capacitor, FVC. And then this is at one second here, and this bit would be your FEV1. And this would be a normal person. But then if you've got an obstructive lung disease, which cystic fibrosis is, it doesn't go up as high, and it has this what they call the scooped out thing, scooped out. That's the overview. So let's go to a real person that we did this week in my clinic. Um, so this is the kind of data you get given this form. We give our patients this form, it's a lot. So bottom left, here is this uh, flow volume loop, and it's got that nice scoop on it. So point number one is you have to have those three tries, because if you just have one try, it's not consistent and it may not be accurate. So three tries. This graph is a different graph. This is time on this axis and volume on this axis. So in some ways, it's, it's much more intrinsically obvious. So that is, these are your three tries, one, two, three, and one second in, this is your FEV1 and this is your FVC. So they're different, but they're looking at the same thing. Then um, you have this incredible a credible number of, 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 of stuff. Look at all these uh, names and numbers, and it's confusing. So FVC is a force vital capacity, and FEV1 is the one we're fixated on. They divide one by another, which shows that you've got obstructive lung disease. The FEF2575 is the middle of this uh, number, thought to be once important in children, but no longer so, a peak flow. And so you get all these numbers, and really the one that we're really focused on is that one that's in gray. And then we um, get the predicted. The predicted value comes from three things. It comes from your age, the older you are, the smaller your lungs are, your gender, men are bigger than women, and your height, tall is obviously bigger. So this person should have been 5.01, and they were 2.28, which is 40% of predicted. That's, that's their lung function. And all the other numbers, the, the bias of the MD is really focused on this. Interesting, I think. Um, the second thing that MDs are um, focused on is aggressive treatment for pulmonary exacerbations, and this is why. So here uh, is, is somebody with cystic fibrosis, their age and years, going off to about 50 here. And currently, at aged 18 years, uh, lung functions on average are about 80% predicted. And in a, so a normal person, as I've got older, my lungs are, uh, decrease. But in CF, it decreases faster and with exacerbations coming and going. Well, this is what we thought happened, but a recent publication by Dr. Sanders showed something very interesting, which was there was an additional loss in lung function that you did not recover from always when you had an exacerbation of your disease. So that this is how much you should have lost over time, but if you had one, two, or three not shown so well ex uh, exacerbations, then you lost excessive lung function. So the big mission is to try and catch exacerbations early to prevent that loss in lung function. There's a big push to do that. Um, the way that that is being looked at and studied, and if you don't want to participate in a study, then I supply patients with this, is that I let them have a home spirometer. Actually, they have to buy it for themselves. No medical insurance company that I know of will buy this for you. But you can measure your FEV1 at home, and if it changes, you can call in. So it's a good way, if, am I sick, am I not sick? Have I just, you know, was I, did I party too hard last night? You can check it on your FEV1 and, and see if, um, if it's changed or not. It's great home monitoring. A little bit of um, following up on Dr. Wang's talk was about uh, biofilms. So aggressive treatment for Pseudomonas aeruginosa is another big uh, bias of cystic fibrosis uh, patients. This is really a repeat of what he said. Um, he was talking about plantonic or environmental bacteria that we have in the room, and that they attach to the um, a surface of the CF airway. They get this microcolony formation, and then they develop into the mature biofilm, like the kitchen sink was his analogy. I prefer a, a mossy stone in, in, in a river 
to the sink, but they're both the same, they're both a biofilm. Well, locally, now this is, this is uh, really going on to Dr. Flume's talk, because this is really the future, is that can we kill the biofilms? So this is real uh, bacteria. Each one of these little um, uh, dots down here is a pseudomonas growing in a biofilm. And on the right-hand column, so this is one of these great big towering colonies, um, the red means dead and the green means alive. And so when these biofilms were exposed to tobramycin, it killed the outside, but not the inside. And that's really what Dr. Wang was talking about earlier. But with an experimental uh, drug that we hope, we hope will get onto the market someday, we're able to starve these cells of iron and actually kill the middle of those towering infernos. And so that um, killing these biofilms or killing um, uh, pseudomonas is very important. Um, so um, recognizing that, what we have currently, as opposed to coming down the pipeline, my bias is, and I think most MDs bias is, is we want to, want to shorten the inhaled treatment time of all the products that are currently available so that people can have a life and not have to spend all the time with the treatments. Um, so all these products that I have on the slide, all of them have been shown to reduce the number of exacerbations. Now that's really by definition because people went to the FDA saying this drug's going to reduce exacerbation, that's our endpoint, and if you don't get that endpoint, you can't get on the market. But antibiotics, they inhaled the tobramycin, um, you can now give it with the reduced, um, at a reduced dose with the rapid nebulizers, E-Rapid, um, and we, we've got, now got Bethkiss on the market as well as Toby. Uh, inhaled dry powder tobramycin, or TIP, inhaled is Trianam, and the airway clearance of uh, uh, pomazyme or recombinant DNAs and hypertonic saline have all been shown to reduce the number of acute exacerbations. So we have current therapy that is very helpful. Um, aggressive treatment to prevent um, pulmonary exacerbations, airway clearance. Um, if there are many, we heard about flutters and vests already at this meeting. And if you look um, systematically at which is the best of your choices, um, so this shows favors one, favors the other. They're right down. All of them are about the same. My own bias um, is with the same as uh, we heard last night, Dr. Cahill. Um, is that my bias is exercise. I, I think that's um, a, a fabulous form of, ex, uh, of airway clearance and it's great for your mental health. Um, this is one of my patients. He's very public, Ken Price. And uh, this is him doing the Seattle to Portland bike ride, which he does every year. And he is 20 years out now. We just celebrated in July 5th, his 20th anniversary of his double lung transplant. So, you know, he's a terrific guy. You should have him here sometime. Um, the other um, uh, issue is uh, there is an association of your weight with your FEV1. They kind of run together. Uh, some people really feel that we should push weight like the foundation does, actually. Um, uh, but it tends to run with your FEV1 because if you feel uh, better, you can eat more. So the, uh, the goal is, uh, as we showed in the first slide of the data, uh, the goal for the foundation is for people with CF to have a normal weight, men to have a BMI of 23, and women to have 22. And as you all know in this room, I think, the oral intake is um, 110 to 200% the energy needs of a non-cystic fibrosis person. And the use of nutritional supplements um, often improves weight gain, uh, even although it's sometimes hard to take it. Uh, encouraging that is very helpful, especially in adults who are having a very busy life. And dosing of uh, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, or PERTS, is also extremely important to get that right and is guided by, hopefully, your nutritionist at your clinic visit. Um, the other point or, uh, about enzyme replacement is they're not all the same. And I don't know if you understand this or not, but I think it's a little tricky. So there are all these different brands now on the market. And the threes and the sixes and the twelves and the 24 refer to the lipase amount. So 
the enzymes all have lipase, amylase, and protease in them. And so this says three, so it would be three of the lipase. To make this um, uh, understandable, what I wanted to do is show you that the ratio of amylase and protease to lipase varies on your product. So if you say, I prefer one product over another, you'll be correct you'll be correct in that the, the ratios, one of these, say creon to pancreas, is not the same. And so you may respond better to one product than another. And you should show so state, and even although your insurance company may say, I want you to have whatever, letters can be written and helped with that. So speak up. Um, so we're still on number five, but number five is a long one. Look after your cystic fibrosis related diabetes because of the point I made earlier about point number six, which is you're gonna live a long life. And although I'm not terribly worried about diabetes currently, because you're gonna live a long life, I think we should pay more attention to it nowadays. This is not so funny. Uh, the man says, your blood sugar, he says to the gingerbread man, your blood sugar is too high. And most people, with cyst adults with cystic fibrosis, their um, blood sugar is a little high. The CF guidelines are now are to order an oral glucose tolerance test every year on the age of 10 and above. Thank you. Um, so the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation recommends that we um, do a screening for our patients, and this was my quality improvement. Most adults with CF have a normal fasting glucose, but then have a very high one at the one hour point and, but by two hours, it actually can be very low, and by three hours, extremely low. So if you do do an oral glucose tolerance test, you have a sugar backup to take, because, or some nutritional backup, because you can get very low. So it's interesting, CF-related diabetes milk is an interesting topic, it's one that deserves a whole hour of itself, that and not only do, can you have high blood sugars, but also these very low ones, which one should be very aware of. Number four, we're moving on. Resources are important. And I am uh, very excited about tomorrow's uh, uh, talk that we're going to get from uh, Sherry Sager talking about um, the Affordable Care Act because um, outcomes vary depending on resources. The first publication on that was by one of my colleagues, um, Randy Curtis, former ATS um, president. And this showed the probability of survival in CF with age. And the uninsured, which is just a, a, a way to look at socioeconomic state, was much uh, less than those that had other forms of insurance. And this has been duplicated by larger databases since. So um, resources are important. Not only there, but more recently, Brad Kwan and I, last year, we looked at the disparities in access to lung transplant. You think, well, everyone gets a lung transplant. Everyone can get it. But actually, um, hmm, where are we here? Plug in. Sorry about that. But actually, um, we, even with cystic fibrosis, that you would think things would be equitable, that is not, that is not the case. So if you have uh, Medicaid or um, or if you didn't complete high school education is often a marker of just a, a poor access to resources, you are less likely to get a lung transplant. So resources are very important. I don't have all the answers to that, but I have some advice and question time. Um, uh, and especially since the, there is a continuing increasing cost of medical care in cystic fibrosis. Um, these are the most recent data we have um, going from 2001 to 2007. And it, even in that uh, uh, six year uh, time period, there was a continuing increase in costs of care if you have cystic fibrosis. The black bit means equipment costs, the grayer bit means uh, visits, and the larger bit, even back in 2007, was medication costs. So medication costs uh, have increased markedly, 173% increase in those uh, few years. So we, we need to focus as a community about uh, 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 resources. And um, 
the CF treatments have been expensive for the last 20 years with pomazyme and inhaled tromycin and inhaled estrianam, but actually the aforementioned Kaleidico is extraordinarily expensive. And so we really need to think about how we're going to manage that and uh, getting uh, foundation help and going through the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and using our resources to be able to get these fabulous drugs is very important and should be a big focus. Um, so uh, we also need to think beyond, beyond the value. We need to think about what the value of these therapies are because um, the value can be thought of as cost saving, that it prevents an exacerbation, but it, and it improves our quality of life and it decreases our treatment burden and it improves our survival. So it's really that we have to get the resources uh, to be able to uh, do better. Um, my aforementioned uh, Mark Guntram, my patient, said resources are important and on a practical basis, he said you should he likes to track his own medical records. He likes to track his prescription costs. He gets a spreadsheet out or a web uh, base to do it. He thinks he can control his insurance issues and fights it. It does take time. And he gave some very uh, um, insightful advice to me. He said, you should be cordial with your healthcare insurance and be cordial with your service providers. And he said, frustration and anger get you nowhere. And I hear about the frustration and anger a lot, but he, I think he's correct in that he's always cordial to get what he needs. So this was uh, Mark's advice to us all. Um, uh, item number three, clinical trials. Um, this is the way you can find out where the clinical trials are, the CF website, research clinical trials, where they're being done. And um, one should consider being part of the discoveries and activities that make you bigger and can be life-saving to others. Why not? That was, again, Mark's quotation to me. Um, also, as an aside, people who do participate in uh, clinical trials, um, we have shown uh, their, um, their care actually improves because you're really being micromanaged if you have participated in a trial, and so every single detail is taken care of. So people actually do better as well. Um, item number two is be organized, setting up systems. We talked about your refilling your prescriptions so you don't run out sterilization of your equipment so you don't run out of that, your compressions, your filters, the upgrades, set up systems so it's not so onerous if you've got it organized. Being organized allows less stress. And then my number one, I hate to agree with last night's speaker so much, but mental attitude is so important and is my number one in patients with cystic fibrosis. This um, shows a, some data that I collected on my own uh, patients. Uh, this PHQ-9 scoring system is a uh, index of depression and uh, we track that over uh, people's percentage FEV1 predicted. We're a transplant center so we have a lot of people down here in that lower, lower level. The PHQ-9 score, you won't be familiar with that, I don't imagine, but um, if you're above 10, you're thought to be um, uh, uh, depressed. So actually, most of our patients are below 10, and the mental health of patients with cystic fibrosis is amazingly strong, amazingly strong. Um, it does um, uh, worsen depression and anxiety if you're getting sick, and it worsens if you're in a flare or an exacerbation of your disease. And so it's important, especially for providers, to not talk about difficult subjects when you're acutely ill and, uh, and save those discussions for a later time. Um, it's very uh, difficult but good to adapt and to accept limitations. Uh, I think uh, um, Jerry last night was inspirational in how he managed to adapt and accept, especially he's adapting to what happened to him. Um, and then just to stay engaged outside cystic fibrosis in your work, in your family, and socially. So uh, that, is, that is my number one. So these are my prescriptions. I'm running out of time. Um, I've, uh, you, you can get a handout of them, but th those are my prescriptions in the order I think of importance. And I want to thank 
my patients over the last 25 years, who have really been my teachers, who have taught me what was important about cystic fibrosis and therefore what things to study. And here I am between my two patients, this guy, the uh, 20 years out from his tr transplant, and another of my patients, and I'm trying to separate them by however many feet, uh, that one is about to separate at one of the, at one of the fundraising uh, galas, actually. Uh, thank you very much for your um, uh, attention, and uh, I'd be happy to entertain any questions. So you all know the drill. The microphone will be here in the center. And please line up, please. One question per person. I really enjoyed your talk, and uh, I'm concerned about pseudomonas. I have um, experience with a very small infant, you know, child, and we're very new to the pseudomonas. We live in Houston where it's very prevalent. Um, is there any ways to, I guess it's everywhere, is there a better, should we try to avoid it with the shower heads, the, the, the drains, and all over? Is there any way to do that, or is it just a flip of the coin, you know, we just have to live normally and there's no way to fight it, you know. Um, so, um, that's an excellent question. Um, I, of course, am a internist and the fact that went to uh, uh, Greece of last night to be really that horrified to um, uh, uh, counsel you on that. Uh, but uh, pseudomonas, as you know, that is uh, an environmental pathogen. So it is, oh, sorry. So, um, so uh, uh, it is an environmental pathogen, um, and so it is uh, everywhere in the uh, environment, um, uh, on surfaces and whatnot. Um, and so uh, your pediatricians in your center, Houston, yes, Peter Hyatt, yes. So um, you should uh, address these things with him, and they will be, um, I, I don't know their current protocol there, if they are uh, routinely doing inhaled um routinely, or just screening for it. There are different protocols for, uh, for different uh, infants. Um, uh, but you can't, you, you can't avoid it in the environment. The, the, the big focus that we've, we've had and we've had at this meeting is that if somebody has, um, w well, we do know that if somebody uh, or older patients, they, they get, they've ha got pseudomonas as a child. We're trying to have that not happen anymore. And then the pseudomonas changes over time, mutates within somebody and can develop uh, resistance to antibiotics. And so the big focus of this transmission is so that one patient with multidrug resistant um, organisms doesn't transmit it to another that doesn't have those. That's what this, um, uh, you know, hand washing, microphone holding is all about. It's not protecting you from the environment, it's actually the, the, the one to another, not getting multidrug resistant organisms. Okay. Thank you so much. And, and I'm happy to uh, email uh, Dr. Hyatt for you. <laughs> so I don't see anyone else lined up. Dr. Aiken, you will be on our panel on Sunday, is that correct? Uh, no, unfortunately I had a Shalom. Sunday engagement, I'm right. so sorry. So this is your opportunity, and if you're around with us for lunch, please, yeah. do this thing that you don't like. Search a lot in internet. I read a <laughs> lot of forums. I love all the natural tendencies of medicine. And in the last 10 years, I've been raising my son, trying to mix or trying to take the best of both fields, yes. uh, allopathic Western medicine yes. and natural, naturopathic medicine which is really hard because I face the opposition of doctors all the time. And I'm, I'm titled the, the crazy mom. But well, I, know, I, I, heard, I heard a lot of things about 
turmeric, glutathione, NAC, uh, colloidal silver, using red cabbage to get rid of pseudomonas, raw, raw food diets, even uh, canna ca cannabinoids, uh, cannabis derivate cannabis. And do you think if is there is gonna be any institution with the will to found research to try to clarify all those myths? Well, um, that's all, that, that, I think there are about 10 questions in there, so I, um, but I, I'll try <laughs> and answer you. them. So, um, I, so I'm, I'm sorry if I misspoke or was misunderstood, so that's good, I was misunderstood. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm not opposed at all to somebody searching the internet, but if there's something um, that they read about, which I actually encourage, that seems different from what their treatment is, that it's really good to have an open dialogue about that. So, hey, I read about uh, marijuana uh, being helpful in cystic fibrosis. What do you think, doctor? Well, what this doctor, well, here we are being taped. So, the state of Washington, <laughs> the state of Washington, um, interestingly, uh, approved uh, the use of cannabis. It, it's actually legal to, to, to take um, marijuana in the state of Washington. And uh, since it became legal, um, I have been informed, even though we asked about um, uh, drugs uh, before to our patients, uh, qu qu quite, a, quite, a, quite a few people now that it's legal actually report it. So, it's, it's, so my hesitation about, um, th and the reason they like it um, is that they think it's good for weight gain. They like it for that. My, my hesitation about using it and my hesitation to approve it legally in that state was that it isn't regulated yet. So we don't know, how, they don't know how to distribute it. They don't know how to produce it, which is huge with the medications you have. So um, the current marijuana, one worries because um, fungus grows on the leaves, especially aspergillus, and that may be harmful. And so, uh, smoking it would definitely not be okay under any circumstance. And um, I, I look forward to what, when the state of Washington is get, trying to get this all figured out. It's a sort of daily update on what they're doing. But it needs to be distributed uh, in some formal way and it needs to be uh, clean. In other words, f free of microorganisms. Um, so uh, uh, when it comes to other... Um, uh, non-westernized uh, additives, um, th there is actually always a, um, uh, a session on that at our national meeting, and our nutritionist goes, goes to those, so we try to keep up with what is being said. Um, the issue with some of them is, um, two, well, twofold. One, Dr. Flume just went through the rigorous FDA mandate that all these drugs have to go through. Um, uh, what uh, Kaleidico had to go through um, to get approval. But these naturopathic substances, they don't have to prove th that they work. So they're not up to the same rigorous standard, which you could say, well, they still might work because it's a, a Chinese medicine philosophy. You don't have to prove it. I take it. It makes you feel better. It works. That's as opposed to proving it. It's a different philosophy. The thing that I, I, I get concerned about, one of my own patients takes 23 different non-westernized medications, and I dutifully write them all down every time. And we have a very open dialogue about it. And my main worry about it is that I don't know how that will affect the metabolism of the westernized ones. So that we, we the pharmacist can fig, you know, fig, figure that out for you if one drug reacts with another. But say it's hepatic, hepatically metabolized, we don't know how that's going to affect something else. So um, we recognize a lot of people try these things, but I, I don't, I don't, um, it's an open dialogue. We can't say Yahoo, uh, but the, anyway, those are my thoughts. So if there are no other questions, I want to thank Dr. Aiken for her wonderful presentation. I also want to thank all the people who were brave enough to get up and ask questions, because any question that you ask is probably a question that somebody else has. 
So, we're gonna take a lunch break. If you're leaving for the day, please fill out the blue evaluation form and leave it in the box in the back. And also, I want to announce that we have an iPad that is being auctioned off, or not auctioned off, but is part of the drawing. It's the drawing prize. So if you want to buy a raffle ticket and have an opportunity to win the iPad, that would be wonderful. We'll be selling those tickets at dinner, but you can buy them now in the veranda room. So lunch is going to be in here from 12.30 to 1.30. All support group facilitators are going to meet for lunch and orientation in the Grand Salon Room, which is across the foyer. And we'll reconvene here at 1.30 promptly to begin our afternoon program with the adult panel. The parallel research presentation track is also going to begin at 1.30 in the Sophie Tail Blue Room. And that's across from the hospitality suite. And so now we need uh, 15 or so volunteers. Do you want to handle that? I am? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Darlene. I'm going to ask right now, I need 15 volunteers. I need you all to take all purses, all of your personal things, and your conversation out into the foyer. And I need 15 volunteers. We're going to completely turn the room. <laughs> 